and running. And I'm like, don't do that. And as soon as he started like jumping and running and swatting at her, a bunch of the other bees saw that because they were stirred up because we're just in the hive and it was kind of late. It was in the evening, you know, later than we should have worked those bees. And so a bunch of the others went at him because they saw something moving. They got a reaction. And so he's running around the car and then his wife jumped into the car, you know, she rolled up the windows and then he's like running around, you know, jumping and swatting. And then so the, he jumps in the car and then I'm standing out there and then all the bees ca- they came at me and, and I didn't even flinch. You know, they went, and they kind of like, they headbutted me a little bit. And they I love those me and sound I didn't effects. Move. Uh, that's really great. Yeah, but it's accurate. Isn't it pretty accurate? You know, I mean. Yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know <laughs> Dami got, had a, got a soundboard all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we don't have a soundboard. <laughs> that, that's just uh, Tom sound effects. <laughs> But you can you can tell the way the bee buzzes if it's upset or if it's curious or if it's just kind of buzzing around. Um, you can tell if it's a drone too. I mean, I was talking about drones, and somebody's like, "Oh, those remote control like plane things, I'm like <laughs> oh, a drone, an actual drone." They're like, you know, that's what they sound like. These big these male bees take off from the from the colony, and 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 I've had a I've had new beekeepers say, "Are they, is that bee mad at me?" I'm like, "Oh, that's just a drone." They, I mean, they they sound differently than the worker bee. But um, anyway, you know, so the, so the bees, they came at me because I was the only human standing out there. And they went, and they looked, and I didn't do anything. I didn't respond. I didn't flinch. And then they just kind of ignored me. They just lost interest. I mean, they're only insects. They, they have a very tiny brain. So, so they just kind of like, okay, there's nothing really out here. And then they just flew back to the hive. So a lot of it is how you react or respond to them. And if you jump or you swat or you move fast, well, that, that, that definitely attracts their attention. But if you just kind of act calm and nothing really happens. I think that's what I love about beekeeping. It's almost meditative in many ways. It's just you're really calm about things or, you know, even when that bottom fell out of the hive I was moving this weekend, I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, I'm going to get a few stings out of this. But if I freaked out, I would have got a lot more. I mean, I got a few, but then I just was calmly did my job and then finished up and then that was it. Yeah, that's the thing I'm worried about with beekeeping is when something sudden happens, I do tend to jump and flail, which is probably exactly the wrong reaction for when you're working bees. But, you know, that is my nature. You know, just ask, ask Jeannie, my wife. I tend to be kind of high-strung and intense, and, and beekeeping, you can't be that way. You just got to be very calm. And so, you know, after a while, it becomes second nature to you. You don't really even think about it. You just, I'm with the bees, and I just I move slowly, and I'm calm. And, and I, think it's really, I think it's really good. It, it, it really is meditative in many ways. Yeah, I'm looking forward for the spring. You know, I'm actually about to get my first uh, two or three hives set up uh, Outside of the new location we're moving the meadery to, uh, the landlord actually agreed for us to uh, be able to put some hives in the back of the building. And um, I literally have had everything I've needed. Um, I've had, I have all the hive body parts, I have all the frames, I have all the foundation, I have everything except for the bees or the time for the past three years. Uh, every, even ended up taking the, the beekeeping course at Rutgers to like prep myself so I just don't, you know, put my hives to death basically. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, and so this spring is actually, uh, I've been really, really excited to do this, and uh, it's been a long time, so this spring is finally, I'm finally going to get the chance to do that, and uh, at, least I, at least I know I got Bobby close by to me to, uh, to be a little bit of a mentor for me for that. Oh, you'll be fine. <clears throat> the only thing I'm worried about is when the weather's nice, it's uh, if we have the doors open <laughs> at the beatery, uh, I'm just worried about them just... Being like, oh wow, there's a whole shitload of honey right here, right next door to hives. And Phil Clark cooking a big chat outside his homebrew shop one time, and all of a sudden it was like 500 bees in like three mm-hmm. minutes. Oh, yeah. As he started to caramelize, they were there. <laughs> yeah, if you heat honey, or if it's uh, it's warm honey, they will um. Yeah, they'll definitely they clue into that. It's pretty amazing, actually. How if we're if we're extracting honey and and I have the fan going through the window to like you know exhaust it out because we keep our honey extracting room pretty warm because honey flows better when it's you know between ninety or hundred degrees. The, the bees will smell that and they'll come right up to that screen and and I mean they just instinctively want to come and get that honey. I mean they're smart. Why, why go harvest it from a flower and then do all the work to uh, you know make it into honey when you can just get free honey? Yeah, like a human being, if there was a bunch of money laying on the street, you wouldn't like say, "I'm going to go work for a living." I'm gonna, like, "I'm going to pick up this money." I mean, it's free. There's no strings attached. What the heck? No kidding. Yeah, I'll be extracting this weekend. 
Yeah, this proposed, year it's been. We had. I, it was so optimistic. We had such a nice wet rain, and and um, the sweet clover started, and then it just dried up. And then even the alfalfa, it was only about six inches tall, and they mowed it, and we haven't even got a second uh, crop of alfalfa. So it mm. it kind of sucks. It's not as bad as last year when I was feeding the bees already at this time of year to keep just to keep them from starving. But oh, jeez. Yeah. I, I missed 2014. That was a that was a year to remember. I'll be talking about that 20 years from now. It's 2014. Mm. That was the sweet clover was like six foot tall. It was it was unbelievable. But but sweet clover is a biennial, so it it takes two years to grow. So you need a wet year to uh, to sprout the seeds, and you need another wet year to allow it to bloom. And so that doesn't happen. We live in an arid location. It's pretty dry. So if you have one wet year and one dry year, you might not get a good clover crop. You might still get the um, the alfalfa. So, but I, I've been moving my bees to some other locations, and there's actually some places where there's uh, fire burns, and I'd like to get some uh, fireweed honey, which usually you get that in the Pacific Northwest, or I know some of the beekeepers in Alaska get fireweed honey. It'd be kind of cool to get some fireweed honey. Fireweed's nice honey. I, I, really, I really like it. It's uh, it's it's different. I mean, it's got its own thing going on, but um, mm-hmm. you know, it's. Gosh, I haven't had it in so long. It's was really interesting. I very much liked it. Although I have to say, if I had to pick a couple of favorites, everybody knows I'm a metal foam nut. But um, aside from that, I really liked fireweed and um, mm-hmm. foxglove was another one that kind of struck me really well, and I wasn't expecting that. Uh, you know, I mean, I really was not. I was like, okay, I got some because it was way cool, so I bought a gallon of it. And you know to try it, and, but I wasn't expecting it to jump out at me the way it did. Foxglove, that's interesting. Uh huh. Yeah, that's what I said. Foxglove, do 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 be, honeybees even harvest foxglove? I know bumblebees do, but that's kind of a deep flower. So yeah, well, um, I know. I, I you know I don't know, but it was. Uh, I got this from. Well, it would have been bee folks because. Uh, it's. You know uh, what's interesting too is that. The different places, um, you know, I've heard beekeepers talking about, like, the bees will work hop plants, and hops don't really produce nectar, but I, I think they produce pollen. They're a wind-pollinated plant. I have hops. I've never seen my bees ever on a hop plant. I mean, I mainly have the female hops for uh, for producing the hops to collect, but I've seen wild hops, and I've, I've seen the male hop flower, and I've never seen a bee on that. But I would assume maybe it's because the bees have other things to work, and, and they're very smart in that, they will instinctively go after floral sources that produce what they need. So if there's a floral source that is better, it has provides more nectar and they need that, they'll go after that and they'll just totally ignore it. Um, yeah, on the other right. hand, if there's they not go. anything there, then, that, then, that, then they'll work something else. They certainly go for the most productive plants for the least effort. Well, they would, exactly, and they know it instinctively. So I guess if you put, I mean, because foxglove is sold as a garden perennial, so I guess if you were to put mm-hmm. hives in a foxglove field, you know, I mean, they're right there, so maybe they would go for them. I mean, they're very deep flowers, but they're also fairly wide. I mean, honeybees aren't that big. And you, and you'd need a lot of foxglove, too. I mean, you can't just have a patch. You need, like, you know, acres and acres. Yeah. I mean, hundreds of acres, so... And I plant things. I mean, we have a 50-acre, you know, spot, and I plant an acre of this, and I plant a flower bit of that. I honestly, though, I do it for me. I just like to see the bees work in the, you know, <laughs> like I'm out there picking raspberries, and the bees are, are, are pollinating the raspberries at the same time, and I think there's a circle of nature there, and I love to see that. But I also know I'm not going to make raspberry honey out of those few raspberry plants I have. Um, I still recommend people plant bee flowers because it's cool, and, you know, people the, the bees need different sources, but you're not going to make a honey from that unless you have only, you know, many, many acres, dozens of acres, if not hundreds of acres of that one plant that they're working. Yeah, well, we, we had, I think we talked about this when you were last on, Tom, but um, Frank uh, Goldbeck is talking about they're doing uh, an organic mead from a beekeeper who is putting his bees in the middle of hundreds, hundreds of acres of organically grown um, plants so they can certify the honey as completely organic, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I talked with her about that. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. 
Yeah, and he had talked about that, and, and I thought, wow, that's really kind of cool. So, oh, and uh, Dingerth has come up. He says he's heard that the areas around cranberry bogs get mowed daily. Otherwise, the bees will go to the wildflowers, et cetera, over the cranberry blossoms. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, because if there's other flowers, they may work. Um, they may prefer to work that over cranberries. Uh, blueberries are kind of the same way. So bees will work blueberries, but a better pollinator for a blueberry is the uh, the native, um, because blueberries are na- native to the to North America, and so actually native bees such as bumblebees are better pollinators of cranberries and blueberries. But you can't produce or have enough bumblebees to pollinate, you know, a few hundred acres of those. And so that's why the honeybee will can be brought in. Many honeybees can be brought in to pollinate those, but they have to make sure they don't have anything else blooming in the area. Otherwise, they'll just say, no, we're not going to pollinate that. We're going to go after something else. It's kind of the same thing with alfalfa. So the honeybees will make alfalfa honey, and it's a good honey. It's not. I like sweet clover better. I mean, it has that cinnamon spice notes where alfalfa doesn't. Otherwise, they're very similar. But the alfalfa blossom, it has a little snap trigger, and to, to pollinate it. So when the, the honeybee goes to work that, it'll snap her in the head, and she hates that. So after the first few times, she'll learn how to bypass that mechanism. She'll go around the side, so she will collect nectar and bring it back to the hive and make alfalfa honey, but she won't actually pollinate the alfalfa blossom, which doesn't matter if you're a rancher trying to grow hay for your cattle. It doesn't have to be pollinated, but if you're trying to grow seeds alfalfa seeds to sell to ranchers or farmers to plant in their field, those need to be pollinated and they need to be, you know, pollinated so you'll make seed. So the, the native bee that is, is for pollinating that, the alfalfa leaf cutter bee, I think they pollinate like 80% or 88% of the flowers, whereas the honeybees only pollinate about 20 to 25% of the alfalfa flowers. So if you want to pollinate the flower, you bring in the alfalfa leaf cutter bee. Um, the honeybees can do it, but you have to bring in a lot more, but they'll, they'll still collect the nectar, but they get smart. They learn to not, to bypass that little, that little trap mechanism, which I think is really interesting that the honeybee can learn how to bypass that, to, to steal the nectar without actually pollinating the flower. That really is interesting. I didn't know they could do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. And they used to use honeybees for pollinating that, but it just wasn't as good, you know? And so now they, now they, a lot of the, I know in uh, western Wyoming, they, they produce uh, alfalfa seed, and they have these little stands where they have these little tubes for the alfalfa leafcutter bee, which is sol- solitary bee. They don't have a hive. They just produce their own little, you know, the, 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 the female bee lays her eggs and has a few larvae in this little tube. Hey, Tom, yeah. do, you, uh, do you mainly use all your own honey? Oh. Um, I, I use a lot of my own honey. I don't use only my own honey. I'm, I'm really proud that my two best of sh- show uh, winners were actually made with my own honey. But, um, yeah, I buy meadow foam. I buy orange blossom. I, oranges don't grow in South Dakota, so uh, obviously I have to buy that from somewhere else. So I, I've, I, I, I like to use different honeys from different parts of the country. So, yeah, I do purchase some honey for specific needs. But there's something um, special when my bees worked so hard to make that honey and then I took that honey and I made it into something really good. Uh, I feel as a mead maker and I I feel this so passionately, you know, the bees have made something perfect. They've made honey. It doesn't spoil. It's a, it's a sugar, but it has flavor. It's a perfect food. You can treat and all we do is is to not screw it up. I mean, and uh, it's so easy to do that and I've done it too. And, And I think I told you that the last time I was on a podcast, my first meat I made was such a mess. I thought, I'm never going to make meat again because it's a waste of of good honey. And it's an insult to the bees who worked so damn hard to make that honey. You know, and then years later, I figured out how to make good meat. And then now I, now I, now, but I still feel so passionately that as meat makers, we have to do the best we can. And, And I think one of the things that, that, maybe irritates me or, or even makes me a little bit angry is when somebody says, oh yeah, I went to the big box store and I got this cheap honey. And you know, it's probably like, who knows where it's, where it's from. And it's probably with contaminated with high fructose corn syrup. And mm. you know, they're just looking as a cheap fermentable. I'm like, you know, honey, I mean, that's not real honey, what you're buying there probably. But, but I feel that I have a, I have a duty to the bees. I mean, I, not that they care what, what I'm drinking, but still, you know, they worked so hard to make this wonderful product, honey. And we, we owe it to them to, to not, to, to not waste it. We need to treat it with respect. I had a I, saying, you know, I had a saying in a, uh, 